All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another uh, beautiful day in Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I think most of you probably know Dr. Hassel. Miles Hassel is, um, runs the uh, Comprehensive Risk Reduction Clinic. It's an internal medicine practice that focuses on evidence-based uh, traditional as well as alternative medical approaches. He's also the author of Good Food, Great Medicine, which was a text that we used as residents uh, very frequently, uh, a guide for diet and lifestyle for improving health. Uh, he sees patients for problem-oriented medical consultations for challenging cases. He specializes in patient-directed, non-invasive, non-pharmacologic approaches to medicine, and he also holds a professorship at Pacific University. He's here to talk to us about brain health and lifestyle. Welcome, Dr. Hassel. Thank you. How's, uh, how's the volume back there? Good, okay. Um, so my feeling is that as a medical community, we don't push lifestyle medicine enough, and so that's going to be the theme of today's um, discussion. And uh, the basis for uh, my thinking is it's a um, lifestyle medicine that should be the core of, uh, of helping people avoid cognitive, mild cognitive dysfunction and the dementia, Parkinson's, stroke and stroke risk factors, which of course are big con contributors to cognitive dysfunction, uh, depression, anxiety. And in so doing, if we concentrate on this, in so doing, we will not just improve the patient's cognitive health potentially, but will help every aspect of their health, and we'll talk about that. When we talk about lifestyle medicine, this is the list I use. Uh, the primary ones are diet and physical activity and weight management. Sleep probably is almost as important as anything else. Heat, we won't be talking about today, but uh, the data for people who choose um, to, uh, to heat themselves in hot baths or sauna is actually quite strong for, for benefit, especially cardiovascular benefit. Light therapy, um, as much as the American uh, Dermatology Association dislikes it, then sunlight is associated with better health outcomes. Um, and a lot of people put nutritional supplements in this category. I think nutritional supplements should be put in with the rest of pharmaceuticals. Um, here's a, uh, the the setting I think a lot of us are in every day, both in our own personal health and how we help patients. We or somebody we know has risk factors. And often it becomes a sort of binary thing. Um, I think it's useful to think of it as a binary choice, although in truth it should be a blend. But we can concentrate primarily on looking at pursuing a medical approach, so a 40 year old, comes in with high blood pressure and gets put on antihypertensive. When maybe far better medicine, true medicine, evidence-based medicine, would be to tell them to lose 10 pounds, get some exercise, and eat more vegetables. Takes a lot longer to do that, though. But for the person who's given lifestyle uh, education and, and actually puts into action, which is a separate problem, um, their long-term health benefits are, are, are profound. They have less overall risk than if you just treat them with medications. They are on fewer medications, which means fewer side effects. It has broad health uh, benefits independent of whatever the, your target uh, uh, disease process is in most cases. And they arrive at older ages with more medical independence and less disease. That should be our goal. If we concentrate on pharmaceutical approaches, we get more complications, narrow benefits. And I think that often, I think we, we exaggerate the benefits of our pharmaceutical interventions compared to lifestyle. And then they get disease progression, drug side effects, because as a general rule, very, very few of our pharmaceutical interventions stop the disease process. They may blunt it, but very few to stop it. And so the patients still get a progression of their disease. Um, when we talk about lifestyle medicine, it's easy to think we actually know what we're doing when we actually don't. Um, I love this case as, a, as an example. The, uh, this World War I veteran who um, says he ate uh, sausage and waffles and whiskey um, and lived 112 years old, which shows that we don't know much. Um, this is another one that tells us we don't know much. So this is a, a case that came uh, um, and had a, had a CT scan of the head um, uh, and showed that he didn't have much brain. He was actually functioning perfectly normally. Um, and there's lots of cases in the neural literature with that kind of thing. 
When we look at uh, the, the degree of benefit of everyday lifestyle choices, in this case, good diet quality, body mass index less than 25, um, 30 minutes or more of daily exercise, moderate alcohol and not smoking. And this is a, a series of papers that comes out of the nurses' health study and physicians' health study. In this case, I think it's about 130, 120,000 people followed for about 30 years. And people who adopted these, so this set of habits, which I would argue everybody in this room can do, um, but how many, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I would question how many do 30 minutes of exercise a day, for example. I wasn't going to ask for a show of hands. You don't want to make everyone else feel bad. <laughs> God, be kind. Um, but those people live 12 to 14 hours. Uh, 14, 12 to 14. <laughs> <laughs> it's 12 to 14 years. It just felt like 12 to 14 hours because they were having so much fun. Um, 80% less all-cause mortality over the course of the study, 80% less cardiovascular mortality, 60% less cancer mortality, 90% less diabetes. Uh, just If you just think of it in terms of the reduction of human misery, and you can think of it in terms of cost, you can think of it in all kinds of ways, but the kind of dramatic benefits. And are our patients being told this every day with every physician visit? Um, If we now, now look at certain types of diets, and the Mediterranean diet is the one that has the greatest degree of, of, ben, uh, of demonstrated benefit. So this is a meta-analysis that's been ongoing. Um, currently, it's enrolled for over 4 million people, 5 to 16 years of follow-up. Um, they call the Mediterranean diet perfect if it has, if it's high in vegetables, fruits, grains, uh, whole grains, uh, legumes, fish, olive oil, one to two servings of alcohol a day. Uh, these are Mediterraneans, after all. Um, up to three ounces of meat a day and up to five ounces of dairy foods a day. And uh, they show a dose response, they've consistently showed a dose response curve so that for every two points, this is uh, um, measured on an 18 point adherence scale. And for every two points of greater adherence, uh, there's 8% uh, lower total mortality, 10% less cardiovascular disease, 4% less cancer. Um, if we look at the Mediterranean diet data overall, um, we can make huge lists of the areas where it's been shown to be beneficial, both in randomized controlled trials and in prospective observational studies, including uh, the brain things, which are uh, um, relevant to today's talk, which is cognitive function, depression, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and less progression to dementia if you have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, in your handout, there's the papers we use to make our case. The trouble is nobody's really defined one Mediterranean diet. Um, which is great because it gives <laughs> the rest of us a latitude to make it up. Um, and so here's what I've made up from the, from the data. So we call it the whole food Mediterranean diet. Um, lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of beans and legumes, raw nuts and seeds, minimally processed whole grains, extra virgin olive oil is the main kitchen fat, plenty of fat in the diet. Does a couple things. One, it includes lots of good foods that, that taste better and it's associated with better health outcomes. Uh, plenty of fish, but also other animal proteins, including real eggs, you know, the real eggs meaning the kind that have a yolk in them. Um, emphasizing cultured dairy over milk, because uh, yogurt, um, cheese, and keeper have better evidence for benefit than milk does. It includes moderate alcohol. And to approach it this way, you really have to abolish any concerns regarding dietary fat as a total component as a problem. You have to abolish concerns about dietary cholesterol, and you have to abolish concerns about dietary saturated fat. If those are hang-ups for you, you're going to have a hard time pursuing a Mediterranean diet that's any fun at all. Um, and then you can look at restrictive diets, ketogenic, paleo, vegetarian, vegan. And you can't find any of them that demonstrate benefit that even remotely approaches what we've, what we've just seen. That's how I abolish them in one slide, which isn't really fair, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> so. When we're thinking about brain health, we tend to concentrate on the elderly. Do you, do you think I was getting some water? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, there's a number of ways we approach this. The, the first uh, that came to people's attention um, might have been the data on people who eat a Mediterranean diet seem to be less frail. And it's been measured, as you can see in your handout, it's been measured different, various different ways. And nobody can really explain why this is. There's presumably some nutritional components of a broader diet that uh, keep people stronger. Um, they seem to have bigger brains. I don't know how important this is, frankly. We saw that slide earlier of a guy who didn't do too badly with almost no brain at all. Um, but uh, um, 
higher adherence to Mediterranean diet is associated with substantially less brain atrophy over time. Um, some studies su suggest it's related to fish intake, some with grain intake. Um, some say uh, meat intake is actually harmful. Some say it's, it's a fine. Thanks very much. Um, but so we don't know a lot about the, the which exactly which aspects of the pattern work, but multiple studies have shown this association. Similarly, associations with uh, reduced dementia has also been seen um, when people in, uh, in observational studies looking at the Mediterranean diet and, and just incidence of mild cognitive impairment and, uh, and dementia. Um, numerous studies over the years, I won't go into the details, um, but uh, this one had 40,000 people in it. This one had 2,000 people in it. And these are just a couple of the more recent papers on the subject that have looked at the observational uh, um, association with benefit. Um, uh, this has also been seen for mild cognitive impairment. Um, and in some uh, studies designed just to look at this. And so this is, um, this is the PREDIMED study, one of the first to, that looked at this in a randomized controlled trial fashion. So they looked at people um, who did not have cognitive problems, randomized to a um, low-fat diet or a Mediterranean diet, and uh, found that the ones randomized to Mediterranean diet had improved cognition compared to the ones that didn't. But these people didn't have, did not have cognitive impairment at baseline. Um, this was a very, very similar paper up here where they, uh, they sh showed it in, in, their randomized in, their, in their trial that those that pursued a Mediterranean diet had less dementia, and also if they had mild cognitive impairment, there's less progression to dementia. So this led to a couple of studies. One of them was the MIND, and the MIND people have uh, published a couple, couple of different papers um, using pre-existing data and looking at if they score the, the people's diet uh, done on multiple food frequency questionnaires, um, score them for this, this what they call the MIND diet, which is a hybrid of Mediterranean diet and DASH diet. So we sort of see DASH diet as the Mediterranean diet with less flavor. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, so they followed these people, um, uh, used, used the pre-existing data for over four and a half years, and, and found that those that were followed the, the MIND-style diet had uh, roughly half the risk of developing um, dementia during that time. And they had to be, they were sort of a 60 to 90 year old age group. Um, and so uh, this is a recent paper where they looked at this concept and said, can we see this in terms of any biomarkers so we don't have to wait for people to become demented and so can see a, a difference. So this, this was a group of people, 30 to 60 years, 60 years old, who had normal cognition um, and they followed uh, um, biomarkers and MRI imaging um, and, and looked at people who are on Mediterranean diet or not and found that people on Mediterranean diet had no, there's no difference between an MRI right. appearance, but in terms of biomarkers, um, so uh, glucose uh, metabolism and um, a beta amyloid, the people on Mediterranean diet did not show the kind of uh, deterioration that the people on the non-Mediterranean diet group did. Uh, this was published last year in neurology. We don't see as strong a data for Parkinson's disease uh, for the Mediterranean diet, but we do see some benefit in the 10 to 15% risk reduction range. Has not been studied anywhere near as much. Um, any questions at this point? It's been a very quiet group. Skim milk. Skim milk. We tell people we'll drink skim milk when cows start making skim milk. <laughs> um, but we're not big fans of milk. If you look at the overall the dairy data, you know the, the, the data for dairy was not, not real strong for benefit from milk. And if you look at historically, you know humans until the advent of refrigeration, humans really didn't have access to milk the way we do. So uh, we're, we're more um, keen on cultured dairy products, so cheese, uh, yogurt, and kefir. Um, so let's look at some comp specific components. And incidentally, um, if you're interested in really looking at a, a really nice summary of um, a lot of the specific uh, components of the diet and risk of the, the dementia, this paper here really has a nice summary of why they put together what they did that, um, that peels down to individual components. Maybe too reductionist, uh, time will tell, uh, but it's, really, it's, it's probably the best overview I know of. Um, but we, uh, we like to concentrate on some things that are a little bit more controversial. I like, for example, they highlight things like berries and, and spinach. And nobody argues about berries and spinach, except whether they want to eat them or not. But they don't actually argue about whether they're good for you. Um, but 
this, so some of the components that we concentrate to, on talking about are, um, are a little more controversial, like dark chocolate and coffee and tea and alcohol. Um, while accepting that we're pushing people to eat raw nuts, whole grains, beans and legumes, vegetables and fruit and fish, and uh, dairy and, and red meat. Um, so uh, the chocolate data is interesting. So if you uh, take people uh, with uh, mild cognitive impairment and put them on chocolate uh, every day, they actually think better. Um, which is kind of fun. Their blood pressure goes down too. And there's various markers that have been used, including cerebral brain flow, um, to suggest that this is probably um, uh, um, uh, a, a true effect. Um, Franz Messerly, I don't know if any of you here know Franz Messerly. He worked in American hypertension for a long time. He would come up here and give lectures. Um, he's a really fun guy. Um, and I think only somebody of his stature could have ever gotten this, this article published in the New England Journal. Um, but he looked at chocolate consumption. He claimed, took the, I bet you one of his graduate students did myself, but um, he looked at per capita chocolate consumption and, present, and, and uh, appearance of Nobel Prizes in any given country and found that the most chocolate per capita was associated with the most uh, Nobel Prizes. Um, he's a Swiss guy and they, were, they ranked fairly highly. <laughs> he likes lint, he, he likes to say, but he, did, he said there's no conflict of interest. Um, so chocolate's good, uh, coffee's good. Um, so the overall coffee data would appear to show lower total mortality in people who, who, who drink coffee. Um, you cheapskates brought me water, I don't know. Um, and in particular, if we're thinking about brain health, then coffee is associated with less dementia and coffee and tea are associated with less cognitive de decline in elderly populations. Multiple papers um, you'll see have, have discussed this. And the greatest benefit probably is in Parkinson's. So um, uh, in this study, what they showed is that the patients who had a new uh, diagnosis of Parkinson's who had 300 milligrams of caffeine or more per day in coffee. So they weren't drinking energy drinks. Um, I might digress for just a second to comment that the caffeine data for, for energy drinks um, is actually the opposite, shows harm. And so when we're talking caffeine, we're talking about caffeine from real food, coffee, tea. Um, and there is a hint, the, the data is not real strong, but the hint is that if we use decaffeinated forms, it probably doesn't have the same benefit. The reason we don't have stronger data is a lot fewer people drink decaffeinated. And so the, the, the strength of data is really weak, but it looks like the decaffeinated, that there's something to do with caffeine or some associated um, uh, molecule. But this is pretty exciting. Um, if we can uh, dramatically alter the early uh, uh, present, so this was a four year follow up. Um, uh, if we can alter the natural progression of Parkinson's with something as simple as half a dozen cups of coffee a day, um, might you, mind you, they might be a little irritable and twitchy um, in a different way, but, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's promising data and certainly something we tell our patients, you know, do you want to give this a try? Um, why not? Um, alcohol. So alcohol has a number of areas of benefit overall. And um, if you're ever interested in the subject of alcohol, whatever you do, don't read one paper because people feel really strongly about alcohol and their papers reflect their attitude. And I would argue that the overall evidence for, for uh, alcohol is for um, uh, reduction in just about everything, but especially heart disease, stroke, um, depression, diabetes is really strong. And so any paper you read about alcohol, make sure you know the methodology, uh, the outcomes that are measured and how they collected the data and whether it's a modeling study or not. Um, if th this is a recent paper from um, Jack, um, 300,000 people followed for eight years, um, suggested that in small amounts of alcohol even substantially reduced cancer risk. Uh, there aren't a lot of papers of that nature. This was a pretty strong paper, so it's worth, worth uh, being aware of. Uh, when we look just at brain health, at uh, dementia, uh, and uh, I put our definition of drink up here. A drink is four to five ounces of wine, one and a half ounce of spirits, and 12 ounces of beer. Which is kind of interesting, historically, before we knew how to measure alcohol, these were the sort of his common uh, cultural uh, levels of, of the drink size um, going back for uh, um, hundreds and hundreds of years. So it appears that um, new alcohol consumption probably increases dementia, that heavy alcohol consumption increases dementia. Uh, heavy divined is more than 14 a week. Um, but in between those two, you probably have some benefit. In our practice, we generally suggest that people stick to about seven a week. Um, it's hard to do yourself harm at seven a week and um, you, nobody has to knock a drink out of your hand at that point. 
Um, red wine may have stronger uh, benefit. Uh, and we have a hard time seeing any way of interpreting the data except that the ethanol molecule itself is associated with some of the benefit. So it looks like we can't tease out non-alcohol components, the alcohol is being dominant. Uh, it looks like the ethanol molecule itself. If you look especially in the vascular uh, world, um, the, the effect of eth um, ethanol as an antioxidant, as an HDL increasing agent, that kind of stuff, it, it probably, um, it probably is, is a core to this whole issue. So you can't drink grape juice and get the same effect. Um, in my kind of circles, then people sometimes refer to dementia as type 3 diabetes. Um, and the reason is that there's a strong association between insulin resistance and elevated glucose and, and elevated dietary glucose uh, or sugars and, uh, and the risk of, of uh, obesity. So we, we would argue there's sort of this um, combination of four factors. The central obesity, which in midlife is a, uh, a risk factor for dementia. As you get older, it stops being a risk factor. It might even be protective. We don't know why that is. Um, it's kind of liberating, so, so when I see a 90-year-old who's a little chubby, I let him wear purple. Um, elevated glucose levels with or without type 2 diabetes associated with more dementia. Dietary sugars and refined grains uh, increase risk of dementia, and inactivity increases the risk of dementia. We'll talk more about activity as well. Um, just looking at the whole insulin resistance thing, um, the, the degree of increase in, in in dementia is somewhere in the two to five times reason, uh, region in people who have uh, insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. The longer you have type 2 diabetes, the more brain shrinkage you get, which just can't be good. And if experimentally you stick an IV in somebody, increase their blood glucose, their cognitive function goes down. So there's several lines of, of evidence to suggest this is probably real. Um, and if this is real, you know, what should we do about it in terms of your 40-year-old with hypertension? Because your 40-year-old with hypertension is at much higher risk of dementia um, at 70 and 80 than if he didn't have high blood pressure. And it's really questionable about any, any pharmaceutical you use that's going to dramatically alter that course. You can reduce it. You can blunt it almost certainly. But are you really going to reduce it to the normal point that, that that patient would like to have? And so when we see our 40 and 50 and 60-year-olds with, with uh, diabetes and we're worried about their brain health in addition to everything else, I think we should be asking ourselves, should we treat that diabetes or should we reverse it? And this is a, it's a fundamental difference in how you approach disease and where you spend your time. Um, because I would submit, first of all, we have numerous studies showing a reversal of diabetes as possible in 46 to 80 percent. This is in a, in a study populations in randomized controlled trials. And I would argue that in a with a real salesman and committed patients, you go in a pre-selected uh, patient population, you go much higher than that. Because think of your, about the di type 2 diabetics that you know and ask yourself how many of them are slim, active every day, eat food mostly cooked at home, and eat a Mediterranean style diet. When you take those four components, you eliminate almost every diabetic you can think of. I can think of two, they're both in their high uh, 70s, and they both have undetectable insulin levels, so they're really not type 2s. They're, they're uh, well-controlled uh, one and a halfs, meaning they've got pancreatic failure. Um, so we, I would see the, the whole issue of refined carbohydrates and type 2 diabetes is critical to our how we approach um, our, our, uh, our willingness to really try to um, reduce the amount of dementia in our society. Um, and I think this just gives you more, um, more references that say the same thing I've just said. Um, I should mention uh, that if uh, the, the interesting paper um, from by Seneff, uh some time ago where they looked at the effects of a high uh, glycemic load diet wh when the patient had a high or low fat load and showed that if you had a high glycemic load diet, in a low-fat, low diet, a classic American, an old-fashioned American Heart Association-style diet, low-fat, high glycemic load, that the cognitive di dysfunction was much, much greater. Um, when we talk about reducing refined carbs, the, the uh, people often interpret me as saying, I think we sh people should not eat grains. In actual fact, we'd argue that grains are a group of foods that most uh, are one of the most strongly related groups in terms of reducing uh, dementia risk. 
They also are associated with 10 to 20% lower total mortality, less infectious disease, less cancer, less heart disease. Grains are really intrinsic to a healthy diet. And in, in our society where there's so much um, pressure to reduce carbs, I think we, we, we run the risk of way overdoing it and getting rid of some fabulous, healthy, and low-cost foods. Um, to make them work for you, you probably have to cook grains at home. Um, it's probably not realistic to expect uh, commercial entities to, to uh, provide you with grains that are unprocessed, minimally processed. So if you want to include, include grains in your diet, you probably need to be a cook. Um, weight management. So intrinsic to all this is also weight management, and there's no real magic in weight management. You need to eat less and move more. Um, we really talk to our patients a lot about the fact that the absence of a gym membership does not cause them to be chubby. It's eating too much. Um, and so there's an old saying that weight is lost in the kitchen, not the gym. And I think that's, that's very, very critical for us to convey to our patients. There's a lot of supportive data for that. Um, and it gets, it, it allows people to concentrate on what they really need to change. Preparing your own food makes a huge difference. Typically, in people who prepare their own food, they eat uh, two to 400 calories a day less. Um, we suggest people avoid almost all sweets, almost all foods made with flour, potatoes, corn, or white rice, dramatically lowering mm -hmm. their simple carbohydrate intake. And that alone, for an awful lot of people, is all they need, really need to do. Um, if, it, if, in addition, you double or triple your vegetables and, and whole fruits, so you're, you're cramming your stomach full of, of low uh, calorie density food, you simply can't eat as much. And so for people who are struggling with, with uh, portion control, I say, now, just imagine that you had two apples before every meal. You'd get bored with apples, but ignore that part for a second. And just imagine you had two apples or a couple of stalks of celery or something before every meal. And I, then I stop there. And every time the patient says, yeah, I'd eat less. In other words, if you stuff yourself full of good stuff that's low calorie density, uh, you're simply going to eat less. And, um, and, and I think the more we can convey that weight loss is a fairly simple challenge, but very difficult to apply, the more we can concentrate on the handful of things that really matter. We generally prescribe exercise twice a day. So the idea being, if people aim for twice a day, they're probably going to get it at least once. Um, if they are told to exercise twice a day, they realize, wow, this is really important. Um, and it's less punishing for a lot of people especially those of us that like to do high intensity, short duration kind of stuff, then, sure, then uh, doing this twice a day is much more tolerable for us. And I think mo probably most of us in practice adopt ideas that work for us. Um, so I, I don't know if this works for everybody, and we'll talk more about exercise in a minute. Um, but I think we really need to talk to people about exercise not for weight loss, but for health, for reducing glucose, for improving immunity. It's the most potent anti-inflammatory agent we probably have. It redistri redistributes um, your fat mass away from your belly. It changes your hormonal re response. It improves your mood. Um, it makes you feel self-righteous. You know, there's all kinds of... <laughs> um, this 88-year-old patient of mine, I use this, uh, so for people who've been through my talks before, I apologize for using this slide again, but this Dale was just, is just a phenomenal guy. And on an 88-year-old uh, year birth, he pulled in all his family from all the United States for a 15K fun run. Um, so we talked a little bit about the benefits of modern exercise, so I won't, uh, of modern exercise, so I won't spend too much time on this one. Um, but I often emphasize this one, less frailty in old age. And I say to people, what do you want life to look like in 10 or 20 years? So yesterday it was a 40-year-old with diabetes. He's 100 pounds overweight, and he already has nephropathy. And so for him, 10 years was a reasonable kind of time course. For a healthy 40-year-old, you might say 30 or 40 years. What, you know, how, what kind of life did your parents have? Do you want to be in a nursing home? Do you want to be independent or do you want to be uh, dependent? Do you want to, want to be drooling? And so I sort of paint uh, this picture that th this is a choice they, they can make, but they better start making it right now. Um, like we talk about exercise uh, allowing you to build your own bypass, but I say if you wait till you actually need a bypass, you know, your opportunity is lost. If you're going to build your own cardiac bypass with exercise, you better start now. Same with if you want to build your own uh, happy life as an 85-year-old, 
start now. And um, I, I typically describe a couple of patients that we have, like I've got a couple of patients that are playing tennis in their late 80s, doubles. They call it Cinderella tennis because they hope to make it to the ball. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the, and we'll, we'll talk about a little bit why sports might like tennis might be more valuable. But um, uh, I think the more we create this picture of ourselves and say, this is me in 20 years. If I continue doing what I'm doing, I'm already on four or five drugs. Am I gonna be on seven or eight? And so on. Um, so we wanna get physical and cognitive exercise. So the, um, uh, the first uh, sub-bullet here is an interesting paper. It's kind of a unique population that's been followed for 40 years. Um, and uh, every couple of years, they measured their fitness on a bicycle ergometer. 40 years follow-up. Um, and they had, uh, I'm trying to remember how many people they had. I think it was like one and a half, 2,000 people. I apologize, didn't put the number of, of, of uh, women there. But in the group that were in the highest fitness compared to the lowest fitness, <clears throat> the risk of dementia was about one-tenth, 88% risk reduction. Um, and so we have numerous studies that show that, um, uh, that physical exercise helps dementia in, in various, uh, to some extent, um, in things like improving activity of daily living. Um, and that's, some of the people who do these studies say, you know, even if it doesn't help their cognitive function, if granddad can dress himself and walk into the ba bathroom unaided, that's not a bad, that's not a bad uh, benefit. Um, others have, so we'll get on to some of the exercise data that shows that we don't really know how to use exercise for cognitive function. Um, but this is a really promising area, uh, sometimes known as exergaming, where they're saying, you know, if you have socializing and exercise, um, and cognitive involvement all at once. So think ping pong, pickleball, tennis, um, as against running on a treadmill, looking at something mindless on a screen. Um, that this may have much greater benefit. And I, from my patient population, I'm inclined to think it's probably true. That simply prescribing exercise may not be enough. Um, so the, if we, some, of the, some of the other data, we see exercise is associated with less brain volume loss, um, uh, overall less risk of developing dementia uh, in terms of primary prevention. Um, if we use it as an impairment, we can see elements of, of uh, cognitive function that improve. And we can see all kinds of markers, uh, telomere lengths, the neurohormonal function, and insulin resistance, and weight management, all that should be protective. Um, the trouble is, if we actually put people on a high intensity exercise who have cognitive dysfunction, in some cases their cognitive dysfunction gets worse. So they used um, high, moderate high intensity exercise in this group and people with mild to moderate dementia, and they actually got a little bit worse. Not a lot worse, but it certainly, certainly didn't see any benefit. And so there's been a number of analyses, and this is probably one of the better ones, um, that say, you know what, it looks like maybe two to four hours a week of moderate or higher intensity exercise might be about as much as you can do to get any kind of uh, cognitive benefit which is kind of, kind of achievable. You know, for those that are disappointed that higher levels of exercise didn't do more, um, we can take some comfort in the fact that it may not take that much. So uh, getting your people with, who, don't, who, who want to avoid cognitive dysfunction, having them exercise as much as they um, want pretty much without going to exhaustion uh, is not a bad plan. But if people have cognitive dysfunction, if you can get a couple hours out of them a week, of moderate high intensity, you're probably gonna do as much good as you can do. And that I think is pretty achievable. Um, some of the confounders that, that may uh, be outlined better in future research is um, it, there's thought that if, they're, if they have high adiposity or low adiposity, it changes how we should use exercise. Ditto for muscle mass. Um, and it might be the type and quantity of exercise that, that are all factors. So there's a lot that we don't know. We know fitness is enormously protective in a preventative area. We don't know how effective it is as an intervention once you have, um, once you have uh, dementia. Um, on the other hand, with Parkinson's, this was a six month study where they took people with new onset of Parkinson's and had them exercise three times a week for 30 minutes at 80, 85% of their maximum um, heart rate. And they had uh, um, no progression of their disease for the six months of the study. Nobody knows what would have happened if they'd done the study longer. Um, but it's kind of interesting, because that's uh, one and a half hours a week. It kind of fits into what we talked about um, earlier. So some high intensity is probably a really good idea. It probably doesn't have to be that much. 
Um, when we think about dementia, we should also be thinking about stroke. And I wasn't gonna go into this in enormous detail, but remembering that everything we've talked about when applied in the younger age groups also reduce your risk of stroke. If we have fewer strokes, we've got less vascular dementia. And so the evidence I think is strongest for Mediterranean style diets, weight management, <coughs> overall fitness, and absence of treatable risk factors. And so absence of treatable risk factors is a different concept than treating risk factors. Because if we say, huh, how can we make it so this patient doesn't need antihypertensives? How can we make it so this patient doesn't need type two diabetic med medication? Um, then we change how we approach the patient, where we put the, the role of pharmaceuticals versus lifestyle, and paint a different picture for the patient. Because nothing seems sadder to me than a patient who comes in on three antihypertensives and I say, oh, what's, you know, what, tell me about your high blood pressure, is that a concern? Oh no, it's really well controlled. When they're still two to four times higher risk of stroke than if they didn't have hypertension. And not just stroke, but they've still got the higher risk of heart disease, they've still got a higher risk of, of type two diabetes, they still might feel lousy from the side effects of their antihypertensives, they still have to go to doctors all the time. I was talking to a healthy 51 year old yesterday and, and um, he was saying, he's a new patient, he's saying, well, when should I come back? And I said, well, I don't think anybody knows, you're healthy. Um, yearly physicals in somebody like you, who's eating well, exercising, good weight management, no, no primary risk factors. Um, yearly physicals are probably a total waste of time. You know, I love to see you, I'll charge you. Um, but it, one of the things we try to sell is this whole concept of medical independence. If you can s stay off medications and, and be healthy, then I think you're, the whole medical independence thing is a, is a value in, in and of itself, even though it's bad for our business. So back to this idea. Um, atrial fibrillation. I don't know if anybody saw a study last year in Australia, they took people who had atrial fibrillation, got them to lose 10% of their, those that lost 10% of their body weight compared to those who didn't, had one sixth the burden of atrial fibrillation. We don't know how that will play out in terms of, of things like microvascular disease, but it sure looks promising. Are our patients being told that? Um, we also can think about this in terms of, of depression anxiety. If we see depression anxiety is, is uh, largely um, biological problems, um, at least the part that we can get to, uh, then, then it's worth remembering. For example, in this study, they put people on a Mediterranean style diet versus their normal diet. Um, and in 12 weeks, people with uh, moderate to severe depression, one third of them no longer had depression which compared to our other interventions for depression is dramatically superior. At lower cost, no side effects, and we haven't just helped their depression. We've helped almost every aspect of their life long term. We've probably helped their social relationships, we've probably helped their job. We've reduced their risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer. Nothing that uh, we, could, we couldn't have done that with fluoxetine. Um, daily exercise is pretty, uh, at least as effective as pharmaceuticals uh, for depression. Of course, that's a pretty low bar. Um, weight management improves depression. Sunlight, um, and, and probably our supplemental artificial light helps depression. Uh, deep pot baths raise, helps depression. So we plunk our patients in a deep pot bath if we can talk them into it uh, for about 30 minutes a day. Amaze how many people don't have an adequate bathtub at home. This is a crime. Um, we would use more saunas if there are more saunas around. Um, we do use nutritional supplements sometimes for depression, um, but remarkably few people need them when we, uh, I think if you, if you really attack them with a uh, lifestyle. It is interesting that some of our nutritional supplements such as St. John's wort um, probably work as well as our pharmaceuticals in randomized controlled trials. Um, atrial fibrillation, and I think I've touched on this already. Um, huge risk factor for, uh, for microvascular disease in the brain. Um, the things that are associated with less uh, atrial fibrillation are Mediterranean diet, including moderate alcohol and caffeine. A lot of our patients with atrial fibrillation uh, are told not to have these. We would argue the evidence is suggests that small amounts are good. Weight management and, uh, and normal vigorous exercise. So I put normal as emphasizing there because there is a point at which exercise becomes harmful in, for the heart. And um, some people estimate probably somewhere between 15 and 30 min, uh, miles of running a week would be the turning point where that becomes actually harmful, that those people have higher death rates, more atrial fibrillation. And there's pretty strong data for this. Um, and when you look at the 
dementia data, um, it also suggests that there's an upper limit, that we shouldn't be trying to turn our patients into, into marathon runners. We should try to turn people into people who get some vigorous uh, exercise, upper and lower body every day, and call it good. Um, Deprescribing. So one of the other things that we see, I think, is that patients are going to multiple physicians and getting multiple drugs. And so how many of their problems are due to them being this guinea pig? So a patient comes in, four or five drugs, let's say, and uh, I said, you know, tell me about these drugs. And well, this, you know, these came from these different people and different prescribers. And I say, you know, do you think this is a safe combination? And that usually gives a blank look. None of us know if this, and it should, because none of us know if for our particular patients, when we get them up to three, four, five, six medications, if it's a safe combination. We're all flying blind. There's no data on that kind of patient with that kind of combination over X number of years. And so I think one of the things about deprescribing is it makes you really um, cautious, uh, critical, cynical about our pharmaceuticals. It says, let's not take these things for granted. You know, when, you, when I see how many older people are on two or three anticholinergics, we have strong evidence for, for harm for those. Now, can we get them off them you know, tomorrow? Probably not. There, there's various reasons why they're on them. But we can certainly um, gradually get them, uh, get them down. And I know, uh, for example, I've got an older lady who's on Paxil. She loves her Paxil. Every time I get it, I don't know how many of you get warnings from your, the insurance companies hey, this is on the beer list, or this, we recommend this not be used in this patient's age group. I write a little note on it, and I send it to the patient. Say, you know, remember, I'm prescribing this because you're heavily, you know, you feel you're heavily dependent on it. We've got the dose as low as we can go. But remember, this is probably a dangerous drug, and I'm probably doing bad medicine. How do you feel about that? Um, and it really, it creates interesting conversations. Um, you know, my lady on the 10 milligrams a day at Paxil, after discussion, she says, you know, I just see, I perceive so much benefit, I, I, I'm going to stick with it. And I'm okay with that. Everybody's an experiment, um, as long as we go into it with eyes wide open. Um, <clears throat> but if you're really critical about drugs and say, hey, I'm using too many drugs in my older patients, then for most of us, we only have one option. That is, how am I going to educate my patients to eat more vegetables, get a little bit more exercise, lose a few pounds, so they don't need as many. And so the whole concept of the de Prescribing in term in the context of the healthy brain, I think, is worth um, uh, worth thinking about. I have two slides here. It'll be in your in your slide set. Um, one is looking at the uh, uh, pharmaceuticals for diabetes, and um, in the abstract it says inconsistencies observed in diabetes trials between the effect of glycemic control and surrogate markers, and on outcomes important to the patients, should lower our confidence in relying on surrogates for decision making and support the case for larger and long-term investigations. They say that the um, evidence for, uh, uh, in favor of tight glycemic control is stronger, uh, excuse me, the, case, the, the overwhelming consensus is stronger than is warranted by the evidence. And so what I say to people is I've got them on, uh, last year I sent a patient to the intensive care unit with, by prescribing Jardians. It was, it was a compelling moment for me. Um, Almost killed the poor guy, um, but if if we really believe that our that the case for pharmaceuticals for type two diabetes is relatively weak, <coughs> the case for lifestyle is really strong, then as a as a medical community, I think we should be saying to ourselves, how do we help our type two diabetic patients get really aggressive about this? Because most of them can. Uh, ditto for antihypertensives. Um, so this is a quote, uh, blood pressure medications do not reduce the risk of stroke to normal, even if the blood pressure is treated to whatever you want to call normal, which is uh, admittedly in, in uh, debate right now. Uh, really worth, worth reading this paper. And so if I say to my patient, look, I can, I can treat you with antihypertensives, with antihypertensives, or I can say, our purpose here is to make you as healthy as we can make you in 10, 20, 30, and 40 years. If I treat you with antihypertensives, that's better than just ignoring your high blood pressure. It does you a little bit of good. Stroke risk reduction, maybe 30%. But think of the benefits to you if I can help you choose, ch make choices that mean you don't have hypertension, which in 80 or 90% of the cases is, is, can be done. 
in so doing, I'm not just going to reduce your risk of stroke, which is the primary benefit from my antihypertensives. I'm going to almost eliminate your risk of diabetes, dramatically reduce your risk of, of, of uh, heart disease, dementia. You're probably going to think better. You're gonna probably going to be in a better mood. Um, fertility goes up, I should mention. Um, I'm going to re reduce your risk of long-term uh, erectile dis uh, dysfunction, which really gets the guy's attention. So we try to paint this picture that there's a better approach. And then they go find a different doctor. <laughs> um, we talk about screen time quite a bit. Um, uh, screen time, uh, at least for entertainment, is associated with weight gain, um, more heart disease and stroke, more type 2 diabetes, high pr higher premature death, um, probably depression, and a bunch of childhood problems. Um, so we say to people, exactly why do you have a TV? What's the point? Um, you know, oh, it's sports. Well, you know, wouldn't you be better off spending your time with your family doing something other than watching a stupid sporting game with a bunch of millionaires running around? Not that I'm, not that I'm jealous at all. Um, and we, we push books. Uh, be, you know, books seem to be associated with better cognitive outcomes. So if we're thinking about the brain, tell people to read books. And it looks like it, um, books on paper have a better effect than, at least, uh, than, than books on screen. Um, nutritional supplements, this keeps coming up. So we actually don't use nutritional supplements very much at all, but it really is often and dominates the conversation when we're talking about lifestyle medicine because people, uh, you know, um, I think it was Thomas Edison that said that the main difference between humans and uh, animals is that animals don't want to take drugs. Um, and so if we stop giving pharmaceuticals to patients, they seem to prefer to just switch to pills and tablets with different things in them. Um, and we see that as a huge problem uh, because they're not getting it that they're trying to be, make their body healthier. They just want a different sales pitch. So we try to disavow them from that. Um, so the nutraceutical industry, I call it the less ethical arm of the pharmaceutical industry. So the nutraceutical industry is sometimes a term used for, uh, for uh, uh, vitamins, minerals, and, and herbs and things. And um, <coughs> uh, there's very, very, very little oversight, including within their own academic, uh, um, um, the, the natural academic forces that should be uh, creating oversight. And the reason is there's just so much money in it, as I see it. So tons of conflict of interest, um, uh, tons of fluff. Uh, some benefits, in the, for example, I mentioned St. John's wort. Lots of exaggeration, like calcium and vitamin D for bone health. Um, <coughs> and so we think that all of the health professionals should really be critical about nutritional supplements, not just um, um, wave them off and have good source of information that you can give your patients. So the one we use the most is consumerlab.com. We tell people it's a, if they're interested in nutritional supplements at all, it's the best $40 a year they'll spend. It's a website that costs money, um, has fabulous data. Um, so if we're going to help our patients a age well, I think we have to talk about what life looks like for them in 10 or 20 years first, and then go back and talk about their problems and and how best to approach those problems. Um, remind them that the sooner they choose a healthier lifestyle, the better. And so it's not uncommon for me to have people say, well, as soon as I get through this or that, I'm going to start exercising or, or doing something. And I said, well, why not today? And uh, sometimes just to put a finer point on it, I, I say, while we're talking, let's go do some stairs. Um, they just walk out of the office and no, don't come back. Um, <coughs> I think we should sell lifestyle medicine as having a vast range of health benefits that far exceed the benefits of pharmaceuticals. Um, we should see problems that come up, often dyslipidemias, almost always hypertension, almost always type 2 diabetes, as markers of lifestyle problems, not problems in and of themselves, but markers that, that, that lifestyle changes are required. And especially with all the elderly patients, I think we should pay more attention to uh, finding ways to deprescribe. Um, for those that are interested in this kind of thing, I do a, a series of four classes with uh, Providence uh, Heart uh, over at Base Camp at St. V's. Um, uh, the next series is in April. We just go through this two hours per night for four weeks, um, for so a total of eight hours. And we have snacks and we talk about this kind of thing and, um, and help people get through their lifestyle uh, related problems with respect to heart disease and, uh, and weight.
We do something similar for uh, weight loss and type 2 diabetes reversal. We've got a class series starting in March. And there's the book that uh, was mentioned earlier. So any questions or thoughts at this point? Mushrooms are great, but I don't think there's a vegetable family that you couldn't identify that didn't have mushrooms. What would you call them? They're <laughs> vegetables, Fun subgroup fungi. Um, any botanists in the in the audience that can clarify this? I even have a hard time keeping beans and legumes in, in order, so I shouldn't it's be an expert on mushrooms. Um, I would consider them a ve so. You know, you take spinach, you take eggplant, you take citrus, and, and I could regale you for hours about the benefits of each of those um, because there's people with PhDs who don't, don't seem to have anything to do except study this kind of thing. So whatever is selling at the moment gets sold. And right now there's a tremendous amount of money in mushroom supplements. And so that's, I think that's why you're seeing them. But mushrooms are great food. I don't mean to deny that they're great food. I just don't know that they stand out. But we recommend people have mushrooms uh, you know, frequently. Yeah, the pr st struggle we have is that the most nutritionists, most dietitians, and most naturopaths um, are, are not evidence-based. And so my, whenever I speak at the Naturopathic University uh, here, I know probably most of you are aware that Portland is one of the ground centrals for, uh, for naturopathic training. I, s I talk to them about this. You know, why aren't we having evidence-based round tables on these area of controversy? Because if I send somebody to a naturopath, I have no idea whether they're going to be told to eat paleo or to eat vegan or, uh, or to not eat caffeine or to have caffeine or not have alcohol. And, and it's just this whole, s whole, whole, whole uh, soup of ideas that don't seem to have any basis in fact. And no apparent, um, uh, no apparent energy around let's figure out what parts of natural medicine work and what parts don't. And so then I see a patient come in who's on a couple hundred dollars worth of supplements a month, is not doing anything for their weight, their diabetes is still out of control. I've got one lady, I see her every couple of years, and I've been following her for 10 years. And only her supplement bottles changed. <laughs> and it's really sad. And I say to her, how much do these things cost? And she tells me it's an embarrassing amount every time. So I would, I would plead with the dietitian community, with the nutrition community, and with the naturopathic community to organize this, this data set so that we have things like, for example, I can go to up to date. How many times do you go to up to date and find something you s seriously disagree with? I would argue that most of the time, no, because they usually lay out the different points of view. They usually, the, the authors usually express what they do. Do we have anything like that in natural medicine? I don't think we do. And so my, my thinking until nature mathematic, natural medicine gets their act together, chooses to be evidence-based, and chooses to divorce themselves from the, farm, uh, the nutraceutical industry, I don't think we're going to have a, a, an ability to reliably send somebody. Now, I have some nature paths I send people to, but they're hand-picked. Whereas I can send somebody, somebody to um, you know, a whole bunch of orthopods, and they're probably going to get the same answer. And they're probably going to be pretty competent. I can't do that in the nature, nature paths community. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so everything we do involves um, fermented foods uh, as part of it. Yogurt, keeper, cheese, sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, and so, and in terms of systemic inflammation, we think inflammation is really misunderstood. So if we start by saying inflammation is your body's healing response, and that inflammation isn't a problem, what's causing inflammation is a problem. For example, if you want a strong immune system, you're going to be exercising. So if you want to do something about your uh, a healthy inflammatory response, then you're not going to give people anti-inflammatories. You're going to give them things that improve their immune system. Can you think of any studied anti-inflammatory that's actually good for anybody? So I put somebody on prednisone, I could drop their inflammatory markers in hours, right? Is that good for the patient? Accepting the fact that everybody should not be allowed to die without a trial of steroids. Um, 
but it's important to remember that all of our anti-inflammatories are really bad for you. NSAIDs, heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, liver failure, hypertension. So we should use anti-inflammatories only when the alternative is worse. And we should remind people all the different steps they can take to adjust their immune system so that their inflammation is properly controlled. So that's how we approach it. We actually teach people that inflammation is good. Now let's control it. Like a kid who can be a brat at times. Not that any of us were like that. Did I answer your question? Um, I think it's challenging. Um, uh, so we, we recommend people get educated to keep seeing the, um, the healthcare provider they're seeing um, for the most part and become educated in what their options are. That's why we have a book. Um, there's people like Char Glenn is sitting down there um, who, who does a lot of my kind of stuff. Um, there's selected nature paths I use, um, uh, for example. Uh, there's a couple of dietitians and, uh, and uh, diabetes educators we use. Um, so I think what w you have to do is say, what do you believe to be good medicine, and then find out who's, who's an appropriate partner. It's hard, it, I don't know of any general group that qualifies. Correct, yeah, so the, I think the question could be summarized as, in the patient who doesn't want to take a statin, who's had a vascular event, will lifestyle replace a statin? Is that? Yeah, well, my practice is to have on both. Um, my lawyers are much happier that way. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, if, for example, if you look at the Mediterranean um, uh, diet, Leon Heart trial, where they took people, it was a four-year trial, they took people who had had a heart attack within six months, randomize them to an American Heart Association style diet or a um, uh, Mediterranean style diet. And at the end of four years, they had a 70% reduction in cardiac events, 60% reduction in cancer, 56% uh, reduction in all-cause mortality over four years. Um, a randomized control trial of that type has never been repeated. There were 600 patients in it, which is really big for that kind of trial. When you look at that kind of data, you say, huh, at the very least, we should be telling people that lifestyle is probably more important than the statin by a long ways. So the number needed to treat for a statin to prevent another event in a high-risk patient, 30, 50, 60. Um, number need to treat with diet, uh, 10. Um, so it's more important than the statin, but we use them both. And I'm not aware of any um, any head-to-head -head data that would help us understand that, and I doubt if we ever will. That'd be a tough tough study to do, and I doubt if there'd be an ethics committee on the planet that would approve it. Did I answer your question? Well, so the question is, uh, if somebody's been treated for depression lifelong, um, can diet replace pharmaceuticals? So for any given individual, I have no idea. Um, so uh, when I see those patients, so there's a lot of psychiatrists I work with who are pretty much into lifestyle, as you might guess, um, then I would say to the patient, let's not assume this is lifelong. Why would I assume anything's lifelong? Um, I mean, but I'm the kind of guy who tells a pancreatic cancer patient, hey, you know, you've got a 5% chance of five years. Let's make you one of the 5%. So, um, so I have that kind of attitude um, to start with. So I'd say, why, why would we assume this is going to be a lifelong uh, process? Let's see what we can do. Are your drugs working? Yeah, but not very well. Well, I'll leave you on the drugs, and let's see how we can, what we can do with lifestyle and, and go from there. So we don't see a lot of reason to get into conflict on these issues. We uh, throw our, uh, all the mud at the wall and see how much sticks. Was that helpful?
So the president of that group came and talked to me and said, hey, Miles, why don't you join our group? And I said, because you're all vegans. I don't think you want somebody like me. And, um, <laughs> and he said, uh, thinking of the $500 a year membership, he said, well, you know, why don't you join us and try to change that? And I said, why don't you invite me to come speak? And they, didn't, they never did. So, um, <laughs> so uh, they, they appear to, to my, my impression is they're kind of, anybody here part of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine? Okay, are you a member? Do you get that impression that they're all vegans? But the last, for example, the last conference of the Lifestyle Board, all I saw was like Caldwell Esselstyn, um, um, uh, um, the China study guy. The China study has got to be one of the worst studies ever that's become prominent. It's an embarrassment. But, uh, and all I saw, every single speaker was uh, Michael Gregor. I didn't see a single non, I didn't see a single non-vegan on their speaker lineup. Um, so, but hopefully David Katz will have more, more, he'll have more impact maybe. So maybe I'll join in the future, you never know. Yeah, um, so uh, for example, I've got one patient right now and she's doing really well and complete. Um, finally got the insurance company to pay for it. Probably better than the alternatives. Um, but I also point them in the directions of the people that talk about how to make your own blenderized formulas. And then I talk about tubes getting clogged. And then they decide, you know, how badly do you wanna play with this idea? Because I think people can make their own stuff just like nurses did in the 1950s. But I think it's a lot of work. Uh, I think it's got to be better, though. Uh, but I don't have any data to support that. What What are your thoughts? And why did you ask? Yeah, it takes quite a it takes quite a commitment. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, some time ago, we did a study trying to create a uh, a whole food product to uh, compete with things like Ensure and Boost. And we, uh, we created a uh, chicken soup that our tasting panel said they really liked, but we couldn't find any commercial interest in it and just died. If anybody has any commercial interest in it, we have the, the product. But it was high in olive oil, fish oils, um, vegetables, and it was, uh, it was provided frozen um, to try to get around this problem so that it would be a, a more of a whole food and fresh food. So um, we're big fans of intermittent fasting, but we would support the idea in the literature that it appears to be just another form of calorie reduction. Um, but if people want to do intermittent fasting, it sure, it sure works well. But if people want to cut their calories other ways, that works really well too. We, get, we try to get along with everybody. Any last questions? Sleep. So it's, um, we're, we're big on sleep, I, I didn't think I had, because I don't have any simple answers for sleep. So sleep's a big deal, um, impro improves pretty much all health outcomes. So we push, uh, we, we argue that exhausted people almost always sleep well. And so the first step we take is what are you doing for exercise? Um, I just had a lady come back who said chronic insomnia and she just came back from Europe and I said, how was it? And she said, oh, it's great. I said, how'd you sleep? And she said, I'd sleep like a baby every night. And I said, how come? She said, oh, probably because I was walking all day every day. So we think people need to be more exhausted. We use hot baths. Uh, we use, um, uh, there's a couple of different herbs and we use a lot of bedtime snacks. Um, uh, and we use some pharmaceuticals. I think cannabinoids is a wait and see thing. Um, I think marijuana, part of the problem is the industry has been so dishonest with respect to the adverse effects of marijuana that it's hard for me to take the whole industry seriously. And whether they're gonna grow up and start being honest or not, I don't know. There's so much money in it, I don't think there's a lot of forces that would make them honest. Um, so I'm hoping um, can have a, a, the whole family of, of, uh, of marijuana products does end up being beneficial, but um, I think that there's a huge price that's being currently paid on the popularization of marijuana in young people 
um, especially with respect to psychiatric disease, that uh, that they're going to have to answer for, because they're not they're not giving the pluses and minuses. It'd be like if we sold narcotics, and gave narcotics without any warning. Uh, to me, it'd be the same idea. Uh, but I've got tons of patients using CBD cream on their joints, and they say it's great. It sure beats NSAIDs. I say, you know, whatever we find out about CBDs, it's unlikely to be worse than ibuprofen. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah.